In a rapidly evolving investment landscape, limited partners such as pension funds, institutional accounts and wealthy individuals face growing challenges when building resilient portfolios. Let's discuss this and more with Karine Ko, head of Southeast Asia at Hamilton Lane, a private markets investor with over $900 billion in assets under management. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Great it to is be hard. here. It is really hard to build a portfolio because the environment is so uncertain. How are you looking at it? Yeah, the way that we think about building portfolios is that investors need to think about the long term. So there could be a lot of noise in the short term, but for them to think about what are the foundations of their portfolio, they need to think about what are the returns that they want to make, what are the risks they're prepared to accept, what are the liquidity that they are prepared to withstand. And with the answers to these three questions, they would have enough to form parameters of the portfolio and then layer on what is the market environment out there, what are the excess vehicles out there, potentially what are the ESG considerations or any thematics that they may have out there. So I think it's really a layered approach and investors need to do that on a more systematic way. So when we talk about long term, let's put a time frame to it. If I take a 10-year perspective, taking into account the realities today, how does my portfolio look like? Yeah, so um, again, I think in terms of the long term, it depends. So for instance, if you are an investor that has high returns needs, you are going to end up with more private equity rather than credit. But if you are an investor who are looking for distributions, shorter tenure, a little bit more balance in terms of the volatility, then you may end up with private equity and credit potentially around 20 or 30 percent in credit versus private equity. And if you are a little bit higher octane in terms of risk appetite, instead of having maybe around 75 to 65 percent in buyouts uh, and versus 25 to 35 percent in VC and growth, you might actually tilt that up to have a higher allocation to VC and growth. So it really depends on what the investor is looking to achieve at the end of the day. And of course, you talked about risk appetite. How much risk appetite is there? We're looking at an environment where the Fed is cutting rates. Um, but of course, lots of noises out there, given the elections, given the uncertainty of policies. What's the risk appetite right now? Well, I think it's a fine balance. Obviously, with any rate cuts, people are on edge because the fear of recession is always in the backdrop. But again, in terms of taking risk within risk assets, I think it's a great opportunity to move out of deposits because now it's actually fairly less attractive. So we are actually seeing a tick up in terms of risk appetite. And this has gone, I would say, over the past two to three years into areas that are moderate in risk within private markets, such as in private credit. And now we're actually seeing some rotation with the rate cuts into private equity. And with that, within that, we actually think that the fastest to recover in terms of deal flow, in terms of activity, will be actually mid-market. Because we're actually seeing some mid-market M&A activity come mm -hmm. back. And mid-market is always a space where there's actually more exit optionality for companies versus the larger cap. There's a lot of optimism when it comes to private credit. Which markets are looking interesting? Well, I think in the last couple of years, obviously the performing side or the origination side has been super interesting because you could be taking top of the capital structure, senior secured direct lending, and you're getting low to mid teams returns. Now, I think investors are starting to look at the medium to the longer term, but even if we look with it in that lens compared to five years ago where interest rates were super low, if you think that base rates are going to come in different speeds uh, out there into what is the neutral base rate of 3.5 to 4 percent. And on top of that, I do think that middle market direct lending still can get investors a pretty healthy return of 5 to 6 percent. 
that's actually still 8 to 10% unlevered returns, which is still pretty decent. So that would be the super return. I mean, we're here at the conference called Super Return Asia. Where will you see this super return in Asia? Yeah, I think uh, for us, we pick our spots into that rotation into private equity. And here we believe that, again, back to the fact that when you have rates coming down, this is when some of the M&A activity will pick up because leverage is now cheaper, companies have a little bit more breathing space in terms of their credit, they're not having to fork out as much cash, mm -hmm. and that is where companies can start to expand and use their cash to grow their businesses, and this is where we see that potentially more NAA activities will happen, investors will start to see more DPI, and then with that, higher returns, I think, especially starting from the middle market space, which we see as uh, one to three billion dollar enterprise value mm -hmm. companies. Kareen, pretty interesting. In my conversation with David Hahn just slightly earlier, he talked about how, you know what, not too long from now, you're unlikely to be differentiating between private and private markets. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's interesting because um, clearly private markets has been expanding. So we're talking about over the past 20 years, private equity was around $1 trillion. Today it's exceeding $12 trillion. And much of that has been the migration from public markets into private markets. So if you think about... Like pension about, funds and so on and so forth. But even delisting, take privates, right? There used to be Wiltshire 5,000, and there are no longer enough companies to make 5,000. So there has been that privatization, private for longer phenomenon. And as we see that the private markets are actually maturing, I think we will see more capital and more companies actually opting to grow their business within the private markets realm for longer and to be larger before they actually go to IPO. So I think, yes, I think the lines are blurring, but I think they're blurring a lot more into that shift of public into private. Right. And when it comes to Asia versus Europe versus the US, how attractive is Asia looking? Well, I think that Asia speaks for 57% of world GDP growth, but today only represents around 10% of private capital fundraising by net asset value. So I think there's actually tremendous room for growth because private markets is about growth. It is about the growthier aspects of equity. So I do think that there has been a bit of a mixed, uh, it's a diverse region as well, but because some of the challenges that has been out of, uh, coming out of China, and that's actually around 50% of private equity markets in Asia. So it has looked a little bit more muted, but as you see some of the policies come in place, I think there are other markets within Asia that look interesting. I like think Japan. that will come back. Like Japan? Like Japan, for you, sure. You, we like Japan. We like Japan. So we think that the there's, the, there's been some solid growth in Japan, for sure. And uh, you actually can see that, uh, that Japan is slowly emerging out of those lost decades of deflation. And that is still relatively cheap. Finally, a reversal of fortunes for Japan. Perhaps. Corinne, thank you so much for that. Corinne Lowe of Hamilton Lane.